بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلی العظیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلى الله على سيدنا محمد و آله الطيبين الطاهرين In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful Trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking his guidance and assistance Inshallah we are going to study the notion of wisdom according to the Quran and the Hadith. The concept of wisdom or al-hikmah is one of the most fundamental virtues that a human being can ever have. Something that is not comparable to knowledge is not comparable to many other good qualities that we can acquire. Something that we as individuals, as community, always need to struggle for. You can easily increase your knowledge. You can work harder to practice, for example, Islam more. But when it comes to wisdom, it's very, very rare and it's very, very special. And as we will explain, it's more a matter of being gifted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than being something that you can acquire yourself. Of course, inshallah, we will explain later that there are certain things that you can do to qualify yourself to be gifted with wisdom. But it's not something that you can go and purchase or you can go and learn in any university or seminary. It's something that must be given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the maximum you can do is to qualify yourself for receiving this gift because Allah doesn't give this arbitrarily. There are certain things that must be provided on our side so that Allah gives us this gift. And when I reflect on the problems that we have in Muslim society, whether it's related to the scholars, to the lay people, to the leadership, I found that wisdom is something that I can say that in most of the cases is missing. We have people who are, mashallah, very knowledgeable. We have people who are, mashallah, very, very pious. No doubt about it. But when it comes to wisdom, you feel that this is a big, you know, uh, uh, vacuum here. So, therefore, I decided to share with you some of the ideas that uh, I have about wisdom and inshallah with your comments and with the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can develop this further. Uh, recently, uh, I had the honor to give seven lectures on wisdom in the shrine of Lady Masuma. Uh, because we just started English lectures from this year in the Shrine. So this is a kind of follow-up for those lectures, but inshallah, I hope that we can go further. To begin with, we start with the verses of the Quran related to wisdom or the wise. Sometimes in the Quran we have the concept of hikmah, which means wisdom. Sometimes we have hakim the wise and sometimes we have hukm which can be meanings to rule or to judge or sometimes can also mean wisdom to begin with i start with hakim the wise it may be interesting for you to know that in the entire quran as as far as i have you know studied there are only two things that are described to be hakim, to be wise. We have hakim as a quality for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we have hakim as a quality for the Quran. No human being has ever been described as hakim in the Quran. In the Quran, we have that there are people who have been given wisdom. And inshallah, we will talk about it. For example, Luqman has been given wisdom. 
or Jesus has been taught wisdom. We have this. But we don't have any case in the Quran that Allah applies the term Hakim to anyone other than himself and the Quran, which is his word. So it means that the perfect wisdom can only be found with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in his word, which is the Quran. There are human beings who have been given wisdom, but they are not that perfect in wisdom that you can compare them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to his word. It is only Allah and the Quran which are described as Hakim. Of course, in the Hadith or in Muslim literature, you can find Hakim being used for people. We say Luqman al-Hakim, for example. But when Allah talks, it's much greater than when even the prophet or imams talk. Allah's expectations are different from the way that human beings speak. For example, let me give you another example, and if you like it, we can discuss it in question and answer. In the Quran, you have many cases in which Allah says he doesn't do any injustice. Injustice or zulm is absolutely negated. But you don't find any place in the Quran which says Allah is Adil. Adil means just. You don't find any place in the Quran which says Allah is just. Always Allah says he doesn't do injustice. Although you find this in Hadith, but in the Quran, Adl is only used for human beings, not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't do injustice, but he's greater than being Adl. He's much more than being Adl. So, when you study the Quran, you must know that the Quran has its own absolute accuracy when it comes to usage of the words. Let me give you some of the examples from the Quran about Allah being Hakim and then about his words. In many cases in the Quran, you know that we have two names of Allah or you can say two qualities of Allah mentioned together. You know, especially in the end of the verses. We always have, not always, but many times, we have two qualities together. For example, we say, Al Alim al Hakim. In four verses of the Quran, we have this Al Alim al Hakim. Allah is the knowledgeable and the wise. In two cases, we have Al Hakim al Alim. So hikmah, wisdom comes first. In four places, knowledge comes first. What does it show? It means that knowledge is different from wisdom. If knowledge was the same as wisdom, there was no reason to say he is knowledgeable and wise. It would be repetition. This shows that knowledge is different from wisdom. Knowledge is a prerequisite of wisdom, not the same as wisdom. And if you have wisdom and you don't have knowledge, it's impossible. But you can have wisdom and a little knowledge, but then because you have wisdom, you know how to gain more knowledge quickly. But a person who doesn't have wisdom and just has knowledge would not be benefiting from his knowledge. There are many people who have knowledge but they don't know how to use their knowledge properly. They know too many things and then at the end they cannot make up their mind. You know, like a person who knows how to cook different dishes. But at the end, because he knows all these dishes, sometimes she cannot make up her mind what should she cook for these particular people. You have to have some wisdom also to realize that what these people you know, would enjoy more. So, knowledge and wisdom are related, but not necessarily the same. In three places, Allah says He is Al-Hakimul Khabir. He is wise and He is Khabir. Khabir means the one who has information and the difference between ilm, which means knowledge, 
and khibra is that normally khibra or khabir is used for the one who knows details. You know, in Arabic, for the news, they use khabar. Sometimes they use naba. Sometimes they use khabar. Akhbar means news. Khabir is the one who has detailed knowledge, who has uh, a kind of um, articulated knowledge. Not only, you know, universal and abstract ideas. So, four cases, Al-Alim Al-Hakim. Two cases, Al-Hakim Al-Alim. Three cases, Al-Hakim Al-Khabir. But do you know what is much more used with Hakim for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? More than any of these three? Al-Aziz. In 20... Four cases we have Al Aziz Al Hakim. He is the one who has Izza. What does Izza mean? Normally, Izza is translated as dignity, as honor. But in Arabic, if you want to go into deeper layers of the meaning of Izza, Izza means to be so strong that you would never be defeated. Aziz is the one who would never be defeated. No one can defeat him. So this is then the reason why it has honor. So to have honor, to be honorable is related to this. Because he is very strong, therefore he has honor. You cannot be weak. You cannot be defeated every day and say, I am honored. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Aziz and Al-Hakim. 24 times Allah emphasizes on this. So altogether, we have 33 times in the Quran in which the term Al-Hakim, the wise, is used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we will reflect on the concept of hikmah in very detailed way. I am not just briefing you with the verses of the Quran, then we will talk about Hadith, then I will bring the views of the experts of Arabic language, then the views of the commentators of the Quran, and then I will let you know my own understanding of Hikmah. Just you have to be a little bit patient, because we want to go into the different you know, levels of the discussion. Sometimes Hakim is used for the word of God. You know, if Allah is Hakim, is wise, then his words must also be full of wisdom. It's impossible that a wise person does something in vain. If Allah is Hakim, so anything which is related to him must be Hakim, must be full of wisdom. Otherwise, what is the benefit of being Hakim and then saying words which are not wise? It doesn't make sense. Or creating the world in the way which is not wise. So, because Allah is Hakim, whatever He creates or whatever He commands or whatever He says must be in compliance with wisdom. Okay? So, let us see some of the verses which relate to the Quran. And the notion of Hakim. Of course, for the Quran, you may be saying Quran is wise, or you may be grammatically puzzled whether we can say in English that Quran is wise, or we should say Quran is full of wisdom. That is a uh, grammatical point in English. But as far as Hakim is concerned, is with wisdom. Very strong and firm in position. In Surah Al Imran, which is chapter 3, verse 58, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, thalika natluhu alayka min al-ayat wa dhikr al-hakim. Referring to the Quran, Allah says, the Quran is something that we recite to you from al-ayat, from our verses, from our signs or communications, and the Quran is. A dhikr al-hakim, 
a wise reminder, a reminder with wisdom, a reminder which gives you wise ideas. So, Al-Dhikr al-Hakim is the Quran. In Surah Al-Imran, the same chapter, number 126, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, towards the end of the verse, وَمَنْ نَصْرُ إِلَّا uh, Sorry, uh, Surah Yunus number one. That was about uh, the Allah himself. Surah Yunus number one. Alif Lam Ra, Tilka Ayatul Kitabil, Hakim. Surah Yunus number one. Tilka Ayatul Kitabil, Hakim. Allah says the Quran is a collection of the verses of the book which is Hakim, which is full of wisdom. In Surah Luqman number two, Tilka Ayatul Kitab al Hakim, very similar to Surah Yunus number one. Surah Yasin number two. Yasin is number one. The number two is Wal Quran al Hakim. Quran is Hakim. Surah Zomar number one. Zomar number one. Jathia number two. Ahqaf number two. Similar. Tanzilul Kitab min Allah al Aziz al Hakim. The Quran is a book which is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is Aziz and who is Hakim. This indirectly implies that the Quran is also Hakim and the Quran is also with Izzah. Neither the Quran can be refuted nor anything unwise can be found in the Quran. So, sometimes directly Quran is described as Hakim. Sometimes it is said that the Quran is the book of the wise Lord, of the wise God. So directly or indirectly we realize that the Quran is the book full of wisdom. As far as I have studied, maybe I have overlooked something, but as far as I have studied, there are four cases that Hakim is directly used for the Quran and there are more indirect. But four cases, at least I know of, that directly Quran is described as Hakim. So 33 cases for Allah himself, four cases for the Quran, and then no person is described as Hakim. Only Allah and the Quran. Okay? There are also some verses of the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is described as Hakim without Aleph and Lam. This was Al-Hakim. You might be familiar with Arabic grammar. There is a difference between saying Al-Hakim or saying Hakim. For different reasons in Arabic we use Aleph and Lam. Sometimes we use Aleph and Lam to refer to a specific person. For example, sometimes I say Rajulan, I saw a man. Sometimes I am talking about a person and then I say Ra'aytu Rajul. I saw that man. A Rajul is different from Rajulan. Alif and Lam sometimes is used to refer to a specific person. When I say Rajul, it means a man. When I say Ar Rajul, means the person that we both know. But sometimes Alif and Lam is used to refer to a general group of that case, of that quality, or of that, you know, species. For example, sometimes we say that, like for example, Lady Maria, when she was delivered, you know, her mother had made a vow that I am going to uh, dedicate my son to the temple but when she delivered she was delivering a baby who is a girl not a boy 
What did she say? She said, "Laisa dhakaru kal unsa." She said, "Boys are not like girls." She didn't say girls are not like boys. Boys are not like girls. This shows that girls are better. Because she was expecting a boy. Yeah? So now it was natural to say, I had made a vow to dedicate my son. And a girl is not like a boy. But she said boys are not like girls. She used, according to the Quranic, of course, explanation. Because she didn't speak Arabic. But when Allah used the Arabic words to describe what she said in her own language, maybe, maybe Hebrew or Aramaic, Allah says, Laysa adhakar. This doesn't refer to a, a specific boy and a specific girl. It's general. It means boys are not like girls. Okay? So, in Arabic, Aleph and Lam can be used in different ways. When we speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes we say He is Al-Hakim. He is the one who is the wise it means that he is the perfect example of wisdom he is the one who is truly wise he is the one in whom you can find wisdom in its perfect and full-fledged sense but when i say hakimun it just means he is wise to give you an example, in Arabic, we say, this is haq, means this is true, this is not an illusion. This is haq, I means this is true, this is not an illusion. I am haq, you are haq. Or we say, ashhadu anna al-jannata haqqun, wal-nara haqqun, wal-nashra haqqun, wal-hisaba haqqun, wal-wa'da wal-wa'ida bihma haqqun. These are all true. Haqqun. But we can only say Al-Haq for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Haq, the one who is really true, is only Allah. I cannot say Anal-Haq. You know, Halaj said Anal-Haq and they killed him. Because they said, you are claiming deity. Anal-Haq is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, whether he was legitimate or not, that's another issue. I don't want to go into that discussion. But Al-Haq can only be used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Hakim is very high quality. So if you use it in the sense that it means perfect wisdom only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his word. But Hakim without Alif and Lam can be used in a more, you know, liberal way. So... In addition to those 33 cases that we have Al-Hakim for Allah, we have cases without Alif and Lam. For example, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا Allah is knowledgeable and wise. إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا Or كَانَ اللَّهُ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا كَانَ اللَّهُ وَاسِعًا حَكِيمًا Wasi' means to include, to embrace. And it can mean to be generous because with generosity and mercy you can embrace. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا As far as I have surveyed, there are 10 cases in the Quran. We say Aliman Hakima, four cases Azizan Hakima, one case Wasa'an Hakima, four cases Hakimun Alim, 15 cases Alimun Hakim, 13 cases Azizun Hakim. One case, Ali Yun Hakim, he is exalted, he is high and wise. And one case, Tawabun Hakim. Tawab is the most returning. You know that Tawbah is not only our act. We do Tawbah, also Allah does Tawbah. Indeed, Allah Metabatabai says, every Tawbah of us is surrounded by two Tawbah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawbah means return. When we commit a sin, when we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we break our relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to some extent, then first of all, Allah returns to us 
to give us ability to repent. So first he returns to us. He initiates repentance. This is why the Quran says, Taballahu alayhim layatubu. Allah returned to them so that they repent. And when I repent, then he again returns to me to accept my repentance. So he returns twice to us so that we can return to him once. Like for example, if a child does something bad and goes out of the house because he or she knows that he has done something bad, so escapes from the house. The parents love the child to come back. So what do they do? They first send someone, say, you know, please go and talk to him or her to come back. They don't want to say directly because then maybe a spoiled. So they send their neighbor or, you know, aunt or someone, go and tell him or her to come back. So this is the first act on your side. This person goes and says, you know, go back to your father, your mother. They are happy. They will forgive you. If he returns to you, then what would you do? You hug him and embrace him with kindness and mercy. And you say, don't worry. Even you may give him a gift to end that bitterness of separation. Maybe if he had not escaped from the house, you wouldn't have given him now this hug and kiss and, you know, gift. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a special mercy for the people who repent. And Allah, he loves the people who repent. So Allah himself is also the one who returns a lot, most returning. He says, Tawabun Hakimun. He returns, but in a wise way, not by a spoiling. Okay. And there are also some cases that Allah is described as Hakimun Khabir, Hakimun Hamid. So the term Hakim is used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many different ways. Also we have for Hakim, not for Al-Hakim. For Hakim we have also one case which is about affairs which are decided in Laylatul Qadr, in the night of Qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to the night of Qad says Fiha yufraqu kull amrin hakim In the night of Qadr every firm affair is decided You know that all the things which are going to happen over next 12 months are decided of course provisionally in the night of Qadr I'm saying provisionally because you may do later something to change. It's not that you do something in the Laylatul Qiyad and then it's finished. But it's a kind of general approval, like the law which is passed in the parliament. If the law is passed in the parliament, it's going to remain, but there is always possibility of sending a new law to the parliament and change. Okay? So what is passed in the Laylatul Qiyad is going to be the case unless you do something to override that. So it's not guaranteed that definitely that is going to happen. There is always chance for improving or na'uzu billah for doing something to lose. So this is about al-hakim, which is only for Allah and his word, and hakim without alif and lam which is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and rarely it is used for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. And then we have many cases in which al-hikmah is used, wisdom. And these are the cases that we have to reflect deeply because these are the best sources for understanding the meaning of hikmah. What is better than the Quran? Al-Hakim, the Quran which is itself full of wisdom to help us to understand the meaning of wisdom and to help us to understand what can be the best way of achieving wisdom. There is nothing better than the Quran. So what I have done is I have chosen some of the verses in which Al-Hikmah is used and inshallah gradually we reflect on these verses together 
and we would refine our understanding of wisdom step by step. For beginning, we start with four verses of the Quran which are very much related. These four verses refer to the same fact. You know that the Prophet Ibrahim and Ismail they were asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to restore Kaaba because Kaaba was built before Ibrahim but by the time that Ibrahim went there it was ruined, demolished the foundations were there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ Remember the time that Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim salam were erecting, were raising the foundations of the house. So the foundation was there, they were building upon the foundations. At that time, they prayed hard to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim and Ismail. And it is very interesting. We go to Kaaba and pray next to Kaaba. And we believe that this is the most sacred place that we can you know, call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because next to his house. Okay? And we are normal, ordinary people. But we know that this is a sacred place. Now imagine you are a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you are not standing next to the house of Allah. You are building the house of Allah. You know how sacred would be your condition? Two prophets of Allah are building the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who has asked them to do so? Allah himself. So you are in a very special sacred time. But... What did they ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They said, Rabbana taqabbal minna. Our Lord, please accept from us. It means that if it's a matter of me and Ismail, we are not sure whether this would be accepted or not. We are doing something very holy, but this doesn't mean that I am holy. We are doing something very sacred, but I am not sure whether I am worthy to be accepted or not, or my action is worthy to be accepted or not. It's only your approval that makes this significant. Taqabbal minna. Please accept this from us. So when Lady Zainab on the day of Ashura prayed to Allah, Taqabbal minna. This was really a big du'a, a great du'a. It was not something, you know, just as a matter of etiquette or politeness. Because you can offer the most sacred thing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but still you must be worried. So, they said, Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, please accept this from us. Wa'arna manasakana. Please show us the way we should perform our rituals, the way we should perform our actions. This is very important. And Ibrahim salam, was a man of perfection. He always wanted to see the things by his eyes. You know, he said, Rabbi Arani, kayfa tuhya al mawta Show me how you revive the dead. He didn't say just I want to know. He wanted to see. Also he has said, Arena man asakana. He didn't say Alemna. He said, Arena, show us. Even when it comes to Malaku, to the kingdom of the sky and the earth, Allah says, We showed him. Nuri Kadalika Nuri Ibrahim Malakuta Sam. He saw the kingdom of Allah. So Ibrahim was a man who was after perfect certainty. So they pray to Allah, please show us our rituals. And one of the things that they prayed, which I think cannot be without Allah's inspiration. Sometimes Allah inspires you what to ask from him. You know? Like for example, 
you go home and you have just taken your salary, you have lots of money. So you go to your home and you say to your children, I have lots of money. What does it mean? It means that then now you can ask from me money. Yeah? So you put in his mouth to ask you for money. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired Ibrahim and Ismail to pray in this way. Because I don't think this would be just their own thought. They said, Rabbana wabath fihim rasulam min anfushim yatlu alayhim ayatik wa yuallimuhum al kitab wal hikmah wa yuzakkihim. After asking, to Allah, asking Allah to accept, as teaching them the rituals and to make them submissive and from their progeny to be a submissive nation, then finally they said, please raise among our progeny a prophet, a messenger from themselves, not a stranger. Look at them, how clever they were. Indeed, they asked two things. They asked their progeny to be guided by a messenger one and second that that messenger also must be from their progeny so they are two things They're very clever so an apostle a messenger from themselves who would recite to you sorry recite to them your verses your communications yatlu alayhim ayatik and teach them the book and wisdom and purifies them so right at that time they defined the tasks of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so who decided the task of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ibrahim and ismail when they were Erecting the walls of Kaaba. But I don't think it can be only Ibrahim and Ismail who could be so much far sighted. The task of the Prophet was to teach the book and wisdom. Look at this, how clever they were, how understanding they were. To teach the book and wisdom. How did you know that, Ibrahim and Ismail? That there is possibility of teaching wisdom. Why you didn't just say teaching the book? How did you realize that you can not only teach, you have also to purify? Yes. So, I think it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who inspired them to pray in this way. So, this is Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, number 129. In three verses of the Quran, their prayer is echoed. But not as a prayer, as a statement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Prophet and uses the same words that Ibrahim and Ismail used with one difference. One is the same surah, Surah Baqarah, number 100. I think it's 151, if I'm not mistaken, or 111. كَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فِيكُمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْكُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِنَا وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُوا Allah says, we have sent a messenger from yourself to you to recite to you his verses, his communications. The same thing that Ibrahim and Ismail said. وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ and purifies you. وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ and teach you the book and wisdom. The same thing. 
Of course, Allah mentions some extra things, but these three are repeated in three other verses of the Quran. There are other verses about the task of the Prophet, but these three are always accepted in all the three verses that I'm going to quote. So one was this one. The second is Surat Ali Imran 164. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ Allah has favored, has obliged the believers when he raised among them a prophet, a messenger from themselves. Teach them his communications, purifies them, and teach them the book and wisdom. وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ذَلَالِ الْمُبِينَ Even though before that they were in a manifest and clear error. Surah Jum'ah, number two. You know, Surah Jum'ah is chapter 62, verse 2. هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ظَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ He is the one who has raised among the illiterate people or among the people of Mecca because Ummi means illiterate or the one who is from Mecca. A prophet from themselves who teach them, who recite to them his communications, purifies them and teach them the book and wisdom, even though before that they were in the clear and manifest error. So the same three things, telawa, recitation, recitation of the Quranic verses, teaching the book and wisdom, and purification. These three are mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala three times as a kind of approval, a kind of answer to the prayer of Ibrahim and Ismail. Okay. The only difference is that in the prayer of Ibrahim and Ismail, teaching the book and wisdom came before purification. Okay? Because they said, Yatlu alayhim ayatik wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wal-hikmah wa yuzakkihim. But in all three places that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the task of the Prophet, he mentions purification before teaching the book and wisdom. And the late Imam Khomeini used to say that this shows Purification comes before teaching. A good teacher or a good preacher is the one who tries to purify the soul of the people to give them moral lesson in addition to give them theoretical lesson. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling that the Prophet was trying to purify the hearts of people and by doing so, he was trying to teach them the book and wisdom. Because what does it mean to teach the book and wisdom? Does it mean to give them just some theoretical lessons? I can give hundreds of lectures on Quran without having pure you know, audience. That's not a problem. There are non-Muslims who write nowadays encyclopedia on Islam. You know, we have Encyclopedia of Islam published by non-Muslims. So they have some knowledge of the Qur'an. Not necessarily everything which is written there is true, but they have some knowledge of the Qur'an. But this teaching the book and wisdom is special. It doesn't mean just to know the Qur'an as a subject, an academic subject. You can get PhD in Qur'anic studies without being pure. To teach the book and wisdom here is something which depends on purification, on purity of the heart. Why? Because it refers to going into the depths of the Quran, into the core of the Quran. And you know that no one can touch it unless he or she is purified. إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُتَحَّرُونَ This Qur'an 
is in a hidden book. Sometimes we say Quran is a book, but sometimes the Quran itself tells us that no, I am myself in a hidden book. And that hidden book cannot be touched except by those who are purified. La yamassuhu illa mutahharun. From a fiqhi, legal point of view, we say we cannot touch the Quran without tahara. Yeah? If your hand is najis or you don't have wuzu, you cannot touch the Quran. Okay. This is about the apparent Quran and the apparent purity. But Quran has a reality and that reality also cannot be touched except by the people who have inward purity, not just wuzu. Indeed, we understand from the Quran that Al-Kitab, which is hidden, which can be touched only by the purified people, is the source from which Torah was originated. Injil was originated. Quran was originated. They are all branches or offshoots of the same reality. And this is why we say Jews, Christians, and according to some scholars, Zoroastrians, they are Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, not people of the books. Have you ever thought why we don't say Ahlul Kutub? We say Ahlul Kitab. Because these are the people who believe in something which is a manifestation of Al-Kitab, which lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or for example, the Quran says that the prophets came with Al-Kitab al-Munir, illuminating book, not illuminating books. جاءت رسولهم بالبينات والزبر والكتاب المنير The prophets have come with manifest signs and with illuminating book, not books. So there is one book which is hidden. And there is Quran and Torah and Injil. Of course, these are manifestations of that book and the Quran is the last and the most complete manifestation of that hidden book. But if you want to be taught the book, that one, and wisdom, you need first to purify yourself. This is why when Ibrahim and Ismail prayed, they said teaching the book and wisdom and purification after that. But in all three cases that Allah is talking about the task of the Prophet, he mentions purification first and teaching the book and wisdom later. So what we understand from these four verses is that al-hikmah is something which can be taught. It's very interesting. It can be taught, but not as a something that you memorize. You know, if I say I can teach you honesty, it means that I can teach you how to be honest. Not that I can just give you a few words about honesty and then you memorize it and then be dishonest. You know, you can memorize. I can give a lecture on honesty and be dishonest. When we say to teach the wisdom, it doesn't mean to just give them some information, some data about wisdom. It means to teach them how to be wise. Yeah? So, the prophet came to teach the people how to gain wisdom. But how is it possible? By knowing Al-Kitab. Because Quran is Hakim, is the word of Hakim. The only way, the only prescription for us to gain wisdom is to familiarize ourselves with the Quran. Not only in its literal sense, but also in its reality. So you have to absorb the Quran. You have to touch the reality of the Quran by being purified so that you can gain wisdom. So whoever is interested in wisdom, 
must familiarize himself or herself with the Quran as much as possible. You must think according to the Quran. You must speak according to the Quran. You must make friendship according to the Quran. You must live according to the Quran. Then you yourself become wise, become hakim. And inshallah, we will explain this in more details later. Some of the verses that inshallah we are going to reflect on in next session, I mentioned so that you can prepare yourself. Please reflect on the verse 113 of chapter 4, 110 of chapter 5, verse 12 of chapter 31, verse 2 of chapter 62, verse 129 of chapter 2, 151 of chapter 2, 251 of chapter 2, 48 of chapter 3, 164 of chapter 3, 54 of chapter 4. These are the verses that inshallah we reflect on them in the next session. So please uh, familiarize yourself with these verses so that inshallah we can go into uh, more details. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين